and welcome. Western Australia is a buzz amongst people who are awake to what is really going on in the world and not dozing at the wheels of their lives, with talk about Premier Mark McGowan's putative legislation, which he touts as an end to the COVID state of emergency. It is no such thing, but in fact provides unprecedentedly draconian powers to unelected bureaucrats and corporatised mercenary police. Powers which would enable officers to forcibly enter homes or vehicles without warrants, seize and or destroy property or even enforce on people demonstrably dangerous medical procedures. This legislative abomination, which violates every vital human right, is called the Emergency Management Amendment brackets temporary COVID-19 provisions, close brackets, Act 2022. It is amazing how few people are aware of this impending juggernaut, which is set to bulldoze what's left of Western Australians' inalienable rights into the abyss of fake health emergency tyranny. If anyone thinks that the last two years have been intolerable for freedom-loving folk, take a look at some of the provisions of this legislative abortion. The fraud begins with the preliminary statement under the heading Commencement, which says that the Act comes into operation on the day on which it receives royal assent, which as we, and certainly McGowan, must know, is impossible since the monarch was deposed in 2001 at the invocation of Article 61 of 1215 Magna Carta. Since then, all governments and officers of the Crown were ordered to stand down and consider their oaths. Namely, are they going to uphold the Constitution according to those oaths, or instead continue supporting the illegitimate, corporatised gangs of impostors in promulgating treason and attempting to usurp Crown authority by a combination of deception and coercion. It is plain what the vast majority of these alleged public servants have chosen. They have opted to continue as if nothing has happened, relying on the people's ignorance and supine compliance to push ahead with their evil plans of conquest and subjugation of free people. Further utterly intolerable provisions of this Act include the appointment of a State Emergency Coordinator who may make a COVID-19 declaration in relation to the whole or any part or parts of the State. This is despite the fact that in dozens of court cases around the world, governments have been challenged to produce an actual COVID virus in isolation and have always failed to do so ending the efforts of such governments to continue with their impositions of scientifically unjustifiable rulings. This Big Brother figure is to be assisted by persons authorised as COVID-19 officers. COVID-19 management includes, quote, the management of the adverse effects of COVID-19 and includes the prevention, control and abatement of risks associated with COVID-19 including, without limitation, risks to economic and psychosocial well-being." End quote. Thus, if these unelected bureaucrats decide that allowing people to roam about unrestricted could have a worse effect on the economy than permitting them to live normally, or if enough people become terrified of the threat of this unsubstantiated COVID-19 event, that these they may issue any orders they imagine or would like to impose on any parts or the whole of the state. It gets worse. The state of emergency cannot be revoked unless the state emergency coordinator has consulted with the chief health officer in writing and they are both agreed that the emergency should be declared over. We all know how that scenario pans out in reality. Any penalties incurred under these restrictions are not nullified if there is a revocation of the emergency, regardless of the stage at which any legal proceedings may have reached. 
just a little reminder of what the corporate government is really all about. But the ultimate abomination of this legislation is the appalling powers given to authorised COVID-19 officers. During the duration of these declared emergencies, remember we're not even talking about police here. Listen to this, a COVID-19 officer may do all or any of the following, quote, Without limiting subsection 1, an authorised COVID-19 officer may, where reasonably required for the purpose of COVID-19 management, while a COVID-19 declaration is in force, request a person to give the officer any or all of the person's personal details, and direct or by direction prohibit the movement of persons and vehicles within, into, out of or around the declaration area or any part of the declaration area. Direct the evacuation and removal of persons from the declaration area or any part of the declaration area. Close any road, access route or area of water in or leading to the declaration area. Direct that any road, access route or area of water in or leading to the declaration area be closed." End quote. Further, quote again, for the purposes of COVID-19 management, while a COVID-19 declaration is in force, an authorised COVID-19 officer may take control of or make use of any place, vehicle or other thing. The place, vehicle or other thing may be in or outside the declaration area. For the purposes of exercising a power under subsection 1, an authorised COVID-19 officer may enter or if necessary, break into and enter any place or vehicle. An authorised COVID-19 officer may direct the owner or occupier or the person apparently in charge of a place, vehicle or other thing to give the authorised COVID-19 officer reasonable assistance to exercise the officer's powers under this section." End quote. In other words, to question or resist these gross infringements of our rights becomes an automatic offence. Quote again, an authorised COVID-19 officer may exercise the powers under this section without a warrant or the consent of the owner or occupier or the person apparently in charge of the place, vehicle or other thing. End quote. Presumably, as a sop to the defenders of human rights, if an authorised COVID-19 officer does exercise these totally unconstitutional powers, they are obliged to, within seven days, provide evidence that the place or thing thus seized were done under these provisions and supply the name of the relevant officer. Wow! We must all send an apple or some flowers to our benevolent dictator in expression of extreme thanks and gratitude for his beneficence. Before we leave this scene of spiritual and moral desolation, however, a final nail in the coffin of natural law and constitutional rectitude. Quote, While a COVID-19 declaration is in force, for the purpose of limiting the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, an authorised COVID-19 officer may direct any person who has been exposed or any class of person who may have been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus to do all or any of the following. To remain in an area specified by the officer for such period as is specified by the officer. To remain quarantined from other persons for such period and in such reasonable manner as is specified by the officer. To submit to infection prevention and control procedures within such reasonable period and in such reasonable manner as is specified by the officer." Unquote. Of what might such control procedures consist, one wonders. And what of police? They can exercise most of the aforesaid powers as well, of course, as being empowered to direct business owners or those in charge of places of worship or entertainment to close until further notice. Sound familiar? So what are we to do in the face of such overbearing arrogance and treachery? We must stand our ground. 
Strident public protests are contemptuously disregarded and will continue to be ignored by McGowan and his henchmen. Instead, there exists a completely lawful response to this criminality, being fully supported by a valid and long-standing constitution. Not the 1901 Australian constitution, which has never been valid, for reasons given below, but the British constitution under which all people in the British Commonwealth lawfully reside. To understand this, it's necessary to go back to the foundations of our system of law about which few fully apprehend because it's deliberately obfuscated. During the reign of Alfred the Great ending in 899 AD, what is commonly termed common law was codified and justice largely administered on a local level where people were judged for their offences by their peers. Enter King John who reigned from 1199 to 1216. His reign was characterised by extreme cruelty, viciousness and profligacy until his peers, the barons, called a halt and summoned him to Runnymede, where Magna Carta was sealed on the 15th of June 1215. Contrary to an off-stated view that John assented to this only because he had a knife held to his throat, Runnymede was effectively a trial of John by his peers in the normal common law manner and John was compelled to agree to abide by the law like any other person. Magna Carta 1215 thus became the primary document of the English Constitution, which, contrary to popular misconception, does exist in written form. It predates Parliament by decades as a treaty between the monarch, the barons and the people. Consequently, it is immune from amendment or repeal by Parliament, which is also subject to the Constitution. There is no person or body of people which exist above the Constitution. All are subject to it. Any attempt by Parliament to override or amend the Constitution without the express consent of the whole population is not only unlawful but treasonous and for which the most severe penalties still apply. For a people to allow a parliament to write a constitution is an oxymoron, for a thing, in this case a parliament, cannot rise above that which created it, which is the constitution. Thus, the Australian constitution, which was submitted to Queen Victoria after several constitutional conventions, came back with over 70 alterations to which the people were not consensual. A referendum was held, but the people were not educated as to the principles of constitutional law involved, which fraud by concealment of material information vitiates any contract. The Australian Constitution elevates the Parliament to supreme authority, section 71, when it must be the people who are supreme, they must have the power to ultimately command the Parliament and even the monarch in cases of constitutional dispute, as happened on March 23, 2001. Such power was provided under Magna Carta 1215. Apart from codifying the concept of habeas corpus and trial by jury, provided for in Articles 39 and 40, it also contained the vital security clause of Article 61. The barons knew that King John would seek to evade the restrictions placed upon him as soon as possible, so Article 61 was included as a promise in perpetuity. Article 61 provides for the barons to appoint a committee of 25, four of whom, if they become aware of constitutional breaches or treason by the monarch, may petition the monarch for redress of these breaches, allowing 40 days for such to be achieved. If the monarch fails in this, the 25, together with the whole people of the realm, are not only permitted to rise in lawful descent, whereby they may assail and distress the crown or its agents, quote, in any way they can to the utmost of their power, end quote, short of initiating violence, but are in fact commanded to do so by the monarch. 
This means that support for any Crown or alleged Crown agents must be withdrawn. Despite the agents' claims that they are acting legally, the people are ordered to dissent lawfully, which is a higher jurisdiction, being of constitutional rather than statutory law. Furthermore, the final sentence of Article 61 stipulates that anything which is procured, which attempts to diminish or revoke the liberties contained herein, shall be null and void. Acts of Parliament which attempt this clearly come under this definition. Which is why any law demanding payment or submission of any kind to Crown agents are null and void and have been since Article 61 was invoked on the 23rd of March 2001. That invocation is a matter of public record and totally verifiable despite the ongoing concealment attempts of the deep state. It is also why the coercive pronouncements of McGowan and the WA Parliament have no lawful validity and any attempt to enforce such acts may be lawfully resisted with whatever force is deemed necessary in defence of one's property or person. This knowledge needs to be spread as far and as fast in the community as possible, because mass unified non-compliance is the only way to deal with impostors like McGowan, who has no more lawful authority to impose such evil edicts than does the manager of the local Bunnings or McDonald's. All courts, police forces, alleged government agencies, etc. are registered corporations with ABNs and come under corporate or contract law, which gives them no power to compel anyone to deal with them. They are falsely usurping the agency of the Crown and are therefore guilty of treason. Obeying them is to aid and abet that treason under the British Constitution. There always has to be a line which cannot be crossed with impunity by bullies, tyrants and traitors. This act has to be that line. To quietly submit to these outrages, even if the threat of the health danger were real, is a price too high to pay. Even the United Nations that cacophonous cabal of collectivist cutthroats in its International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights acknowledges that not even a threat to the very existence of a nation justifies the wholesale destruction of people's inalienable rights. They must be left free enough to determine their own destinies, and that specifically includes retaining their bodily integrity and property rights. Stand firm. Mm -hmm.